what I'd like you to start with, uh, sort of to set the tone for the conversation, is, um, you know, obviously we've been doing a deep dive for the last couple of days and we've been talking about uh, the applications of machine learning and AI. Um, how far do you think uh, we've come and how far do we need to go in terms of integrating AI and that capability throughout an organization? Obviously, there have been niche groups within many big organizations, probably Bloomberg and others included, um, but that knowledge base, that capability has to permeate really to take full advantage. What, what thoughts can you share about that? So I think it's, it, one, it depends on the organization and how large and complex it is. And two, it also depends on the people that are involved in trying to integrate AI. And I'd say that the early successes that can be had and that are visible oftentimes will determine um, the embrace that you see across an organization. I think what we're starting to see, or at least what I'm starting to see, is a little bit of a hybrid approach where you're taking, say, for example, within the research within a research um, operation, your traditional fundamental analyst trying to understand how machine learning, big data can help uh, make their own analysis a bit better. Um, I think that there's a bit of of selling that needs to happen because oftentimes people that have been ingrained um, in their own analysis, it takes a while for them to start to embrace new techniques. But the, I, the, the more that, the more results that, you, that are visible, the more people can understand the, on how it could enhance their investment philosophy, that's when you start to see the integration um, coming together. And it's happening. Um, so it, would you say that we are at the beginning? Or are we partway through? Where, what would you be your guess? I think it's, if you look at the amount of information that is coming, that, that's covered in the press that you see um, in terms of the questions that we're fielding on how we're using big data <laughs> or artificial intelligence, I think we're definitely um, moving further along. And I think, and my uh, own impression is over the last two to three years, there's a much greater understanding. Um, now, we're not, you know, your traditional long short funds, your traditional fundamentally driven um, investors are at different phases in the cycle, but there's the interest level is there, and there's so much, um, I, I think, uh, opportunity that people want to learn more, um, and it's just a matter of whether they're at the beginning of just kind of exploring how they can embed AI into their investment uh, processes, or whether they're actually you know, doing the work and making the investment to, uh, to do it properly, but we're getting there. And uh, Arun, I'd like um, to jump to you. Bloomberg's a tiny organization. Um, you are part of a, a quantitative research group within Bloomberg. Um, there you know, are multiple facets of that company. You've got the media side, you've got the terminal side, you've got um, research, you've got trade book, you've got all of these um, pieces that there doesn't seem to be, unless you're inside of Bloomberg, a logic of tying them together. Um, but where do you fit in that puzzle? Yes, so uh, we are in the in the financial product division, which serves um, our terminal business as well as our enterprise data license business. So we we help with quantitative research across those areas, and uh, um, you know, uh, and we are an umbrella research team. We are helping many different business incubation of many different business uh, business projects and ideas for the company. And um, to to tie it back to the previous question, I mean, uh, it's, it's one of the things we noticed is that. To, to build uh, capabilities for uh, for machine learning and data science, we we took like a sort of a two-phase approach. We wanted to first build something uh, for internal use that we can we can empower our own data scientists and quants uh, to build uh, uh, to do sort of a quick sort of uh, um, uh, building their projects uh, and then moving on to building sort of actual toolkits and, and products uh, which are still internal facing that help our our businesses uh, for their for their for their deliverables but now we are slowly turning that around and putting out uh, a platform product 
which is based on the same infrastructure, which is going to be client-facing, where our clients will be able to come onto a Bloomberg ecosystem and actually carry out uh, machine learning tasks. They will be able to program against our data, um, you know, use Bloomberg's uh, libraries and, and APIs into different analytics and be able to um, uh, have a sort of a full computational environment. So uh, you kind of were the internal beta testers, sort of getting it off yeah. the ground, and, and then someone came along that was smart and said, let's package and sell it. It's an interesting role because we, yeah, we do help with the initial incubation, and then we flip back around and act as customers as well. So it's, um, it's, it's pretty exciting. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Andre and David, um, I'd like to go to Andre first, and then David with the same question. Both of you are investment managers. Um, this isn't... Uh, sort of basic uh, to explain to an actual investor that you might be talking to. Some of these methodologies, whether it's a quantitative investment strategy or something that is, uh, you know, including AI or, or some very complex uh, mathematical algorithms, how are you selling this idea to your end investors? And Andre, I would start with you. Are you finding, um, sort of based on the type of investor, a different level of sophistication and understanding of what it is that you do? Absolutely. The level of sophistication varies dramatically. Uh, some people are actually on the cutting edge and they do understand what it takes. They can uh, spot and see through the managers who uh, know what they're doing versus those who are just at the very beginning of this process. Uh, and there are others who are just getting to learn what it takes and uh, they're at the very, very early stages. Now, the way you sell it, there is no right answer because most of these techniques have not really been tested by a large group of people. So it's a little bit early uh, to say that it is being adapt adopted by a lot of people. So what you have to do, you have to find people who are believers in this space, number one, and are ready to take a leap of faith to invest in you uh, early on. Uh, the reason they have to do this is because largely and almost by definition, these quantitative strategies are capacity constrained. So by the time you have a long enough track record to market it, uh, you don't really accept a lot of new capital in. So uh, it's a chicken and an egg uh, game. Relating to an earlier comment, what needs to happen, I think uh, there is one fundamental uh, problem with uh, fundamental investors, stock pickers, shifting into machine learning and big data applications and using that internally. The reason is, Let's say you're a discretionary stock picker, and all of a sudden you have a group of quantitative guys and PhDs helping you with your investment decision process. Who takes the credit internally? That's a big question, and uh, it drives a lot of decision making. But I already believe that people have to work together in order to solve this. This is not trivial. It's not trivial by any extent. And motivations matter. So unless you design a process where people work together, uh, to come to an outcome, uh, it's hard to solve. And there's another problem. Discretionary analysts are usually operating in silos, uh, and there are good reasons for why that is the setup, where quantitative managers is good to work as a team. You need technology, uh, working together with data, working together with machine learning people, uh, working with people who understand how markets work, all working side by side. And that's not easy to achieve. Uh, so some smart investors have already realized that, and they're looking for different types of talent within an organization, and once they spot it, they're ready to allocate. Uh, other people are at the very beginning, you need to educate them. You need to educate them. And David, um, in terms of your ability to explain this or, or the types of investors that are in your hedge fund, sure. um, is there a level of sophistication that, uh, that you aim for? And then I would like you to add to that, what category do your investors tend to be? Are they family offices, wealthy individuals, or are we talking pensions, endowments, foundations, and sure. institutions? So, you know, we, we're fairly new. So we, we, we launched in August 2015. And in the beginning, um, it, you know, it, it's been, fam you know, friends and family. Uh, we're starting to, you know, we're getting feelers out there, and, and the conversations, you know, are now becoming a little bit more serious. We're, we're you know, we're, 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 we're getting, uh, uh, looked out uh, more carefully now. In, in the beginning, it was all about black box, ha ha ha, quant. Uh, th there were a lot of things you have to overcome in the beginning. But uh, you know, almost uh, at, at three years now, and with our performance, and you know, going back to the, the the most recent political cycle, and being able to you know point to, hey, you know, our, our algorithms predicted uh, President Trump victory in June of 2016, and this is what we did since then. 
Um, you know, Another we've done very Trump indicator. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've done very well. But it, it, a good fund manager, it, from my perspective, you've got to anticipate these factors. And that's kind of, you know, we predicted a Trump uh, victory. Um, we're not mimicking. We're not, we're not uh, loading up on any one factor. Um, we're spreading out the risk. And we're, we're anticipating these factors. So I, I believe vest, investors are starting to see the robustness of our models. Um, and, you know, we're getting some traction from family offices now uh, and, and, you know, sophisticated ultra high net worth individuals. So. Okay. And uh, Andre, back to you for, for a moment. Um, what types of investors does your fund at attract? So we have taken a slightly different approach. We're building a firm for a very long uh, term. So the first couple of years we took just to build technology internally. We're lucky enough to get seated by a multi-billion dollar family office so we didn't really have to worry too much about expenses. Uh, we have invested a lot, both time, money, and intellectual capital in building the platform. And we have been trading on the managed account. Uh, and we're just about to open up a fund. The traction we're getting is, I would say somewhat similar, uh, more sophisticated fund of funds, uh, seed allocators uh, who believe in this space for the long run are interested, and ultra high net worth individuals who, in my experience, just like the hype of the story, and they understand conceptually that this is the future, but they're not in the weeds yet understanding of what it takes and how it works. Yeah. Uh, do you I add to that? Mm -hmm. I just want to add, you know, so sophisticated investors, they appreciate, you know, you're, you're, we're protecting your cap. We're not, an, you know, an all-weather fund. We like to perform, obviously, in every environment, but we're protecting your capital from systemic risk or systematic risk. And sophisticated investors, no matter what, they get it and they, and they appreciate it. You know, people that, you know, these retail investors or these high net worth in-between investors that, you know, listen to... CNBC and Bloomberg all day. That's not. That's just not our guy. They're, so, they're higher maintenance yeah, investors, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And um, and and I, I, I can understand that. And I'll tell you, it is something I've heard from numerous managers that um, uh, you know they would rather um, pursue family offices that might have a more sophisticated internal team, or they'd rather pursue a pension or an endowment or or an, an institution for that matter. You know, an individual ultra high net worth person, you know, you could be a multimillionaire and not understand what a sharp ratio is, and most don't. Right. So I think that there is, um, there is that challenge of just high maintenance and education and sort of bringing them up. The education the part's great, because at the end of the, you know, at the end of the conversation, they, they get it. Uh, but there's still, there's still risk. And, you know, some of these high net worth individuals, they don't get it. They just see the S&P going up one way. They forgot what it's like, uh, you know, for, you know, volatility and whatnot, so. Um, right. So, you know, one of the things that I like to do and, uh, you know, I've had a long resume, so you guys don't know this either, but I used to pick managers and seed them. So I was uh, I had a fancy title once called the VP of uh, Capital Introduction. And uh, for two funds of hedge funds, my job was to do. Does anyone remember a performance uh, system mm -hmm. called Pertrack? anyone remember that? So my job was I was the per track guy. I was the guy who understood how to use the per track software. I was the guy who ran the system and worked with an investment committee of allocators, including people like Jack Schwager and Tom DeMarc and others, to sort of pick managers and, 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 uh, and put them into fund of funds. And, um, you know, along the way, one of the things that, uh, that I like to do is I like to find out from managers. Now I'm going to start with the managers, um, and then I'm going to ask uh, Pam and... Uh, and Arun to sort of chime in as well. But why don't you tell us for two minutes, uh, starting with you, David, your story. Give us your elevator pitch. What is Coral Gables Asset Management? What do you do? I'd like to think at the end of the day, no matter what, we protect your capital at, at all costs. Um, What's your strategy? So we are a market neutral, long, short quant fund. Uh, again, it's, it's based on the emerging field of behavioral finance. I guess I wouldn't consider it emerging anymore. I think it's, you know, we're, 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 we're seeing a little bit more uh, behavioral finance and the theory and the application today. Um, you know, it, it, we have three, uh, three main signals or models. The first model is uh, geographic diffusion. Uh, the second model is the sensitivity to the political environment. And the third model is your, your plain Jane momentum model. Um, the first two, you know, it, 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 it's very intuitive if you think about it. 
Um, geographic diffusion, it, it's really how one company, you know, we say there are X amount of publicly traded companies in the United States, and on average, six of them are economically connected geographically throughout the US. So, you know, if we can predict what's going on in California or what's going on in Texas, you know, via certain variables or factors uh, in the macro economy in these individual states, then we should be able to predict a quarter ahead or quarter, two quarters ahead earnings. Uh, and, and we come up with our long short portfolio based on the sensitivity and, and the frequency. Um, the political sensitivity environment uh, or sensitivity to the political environment, it's basically we're, you know, we're mathematically assigning betas to each industry and we're analyzing uh, through textual analysis and, and other uh, programs um, how sensitive an industry is to a, a Republican regime versus a Democrat regime. And uh, we will put our stocks in the two baskets uh, and uh, build our, our second model that way. And then the play momentum model is just your play momentum model. Uh, nothing unique there. Um, we are systematic. Uh, we have a ranking uh, system um, for stock selection. And um, that's, that's it. That's great. And Pam, uh, you know, I haven't forgotten about you. So uh, if you could give the microphone to Pam, if she doesn't have, she has one, okay, great. Um, so you have a couple of hats. So you um, provide, you, you have a team that provides in-depth analysis and ideas across equity derivatives, um, but you also co-lead a data, innovative, da data innovation research at Deutsche. What is that? Uh, so effectively, I think, you know, going back to how do you pitch uh, using alternative data and, and analysis techniques to clients, well, or, or you know, even internally, the proliferation of data has been incredible. I, I, there are a number of presentations on it today about how many data, alternative data vendors are out there, how do you use data within an investment process. What we're trying to do at Deutsche is across a very talented team of analysts that cover different stocks, sectors, um, macro analysts, understand what data inputs we have internally already, how they can be leveraged to come up with intelligent investment signals that are differentiated, how we can help our clients um, with their own data needs, and also um, within our quant research effort, we have a very talented team of researchers that are um, rooted in their uh, entirely independent analysis that will um, look at some of the, the newer uh, quantitative research techniques, that factor construction, testing out new data sets, publishing on, the, on those techniques, and then helping clients embed those, um, those processes and, and their findings within their, own, um, within their own investment philosophy. So what we try to do um, is be uh, a, a step ahead of what our clients are looking at won't have the answers for everyone, but certainly trying to, um, from a very rigorous uh, research standpoint, understand what some of the new techniques in the market are and partnering with clients to help um, make their own investment uh, decisions a little bit better. And I think, you know, going back to the earlier question, oftentimes that's bridging um, the very um, sophisticated, purely quantitative approach and a stock picking approach that has traditionally been more fundamental in nature in trying to get people to understand, well, here's an overlay strategy that, you, that can help you make better investment decisions. Right, so they might not be ready to go purely quant and uh, they're they have a comfort zone, but you can uh, help explain how sort of the, the quantitative aspect can be an overlay and sort of reinforce those signals. That's right, and I think that, you know, just about anyone is going to understand right now that new data and what is um, and how quickly um, signals are changing, um, it is going to be a benefit to, to try to embed that into your investment process no matter how you know, active of a manager you are. Great, thank you. And uh, Arun, over to you. Um, what do you do? Um, well, 
Yes, you know, we do wear a bunch of hats. We, um, well, first of all, just to sort of back it up, uh, you know, I think Bloomberg is more of a sort of services company, so we essentially provide news data and analytics. Sure, but and how about you? What yes, do you do? so we, you know, we help with um, um, looking at uh, some of the new data sets that Bloomberg is onboarding, like supply chain, for example, and extracting derived signals from it that we can help, uh, um, you know, uh, that, that, that can help market the data to our hedge fund clients, for example. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, the, the raw data itself is, uh, is, is quite a beast, right? So we, we help clean it, normalize it. Uh, we, we make sure um, some, of the, some of the aspects that are important to, for, for quant to work with, for example, the point in time quality of these data sets is critical. Um, you know, as, as you know, uh, some of the machine learning models that People are people are trying these days. They're essentially you know, error maximizers in a, in, in a way because if their data has any errors, then they will uh, essentially learn that error and 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 be very very biased. So uh, it's very important to make sure data is free of uh, for of those biases, whether it's any sort of look ahead bias or any survivorship bias. Uh, those those uh, those can really you know, really be critical, especially in a black box environment like machine learning. So we, we try to bring sort of scientific, scientific rigor to these different businesses within the Bloomberg, make sure they are following the best quant practices. Great. Um, Andre, um, give us a little more of a deeper dive of the strategy. Obviously, um, you're very lucky you had a family office seed you, but that's not going to last forever. You're soon going to have to go on a road show and explain it to someone like me that is skeptical, that is going to ask you and, you know, look under the hood and ask you about every aspect from your team's pedigree down to will you please show me what's in form PF. So please uh, give me a, an elevator pitch if you would. So we started thinking about this company back in 2010. Uh, the idea came from us from fundamental investing. We saw that changes in information and access to information drive security prices. The more you have of it, the better information you have, the better decision making you potentially can make. There was a second trend, which was very obvious even back then, that the enormous growth in information is likely to continue, and a lot of that information is coming in machine-readable form. What that means is there's just way too much stuff that is coming towards humans. You need a platform to be able to utilize all of those data, bring it together, structure, and make informed investment decisions. We went out and pitched that idea to a number of people, uh, eventually pitched it to Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan. He loved it so much he wanted it for himself. So he hired one of uh, uh, my friends and now uh, business partner to build the first big data machine learning unit within JP Morgan. Uh, after doing that for a few years, we spun out, or he left, and we restarted data capital management back in uh, late 2014. Now what we do, uh, we bring in quite a bit of different data sets, uh, both traditional and non-traditional alternative, and we build investment models on that. Differentiation that we have, we think, is our regime-aware approach. We do not believe that systematic investing works uh, in all the regimes. It works until the regime changes. And that goes back to machine learning. If you train your machine learning on a certain regime, then the regime changes and doesn't realize it. It's not going to produce great results. Uh, a very intuitive example of that would be you have a trend-following model uh, in a sideways volatility market. It's unlikely to work well, and vice versa. Therefore, regime prediction is paramount, and selecting of which models to allocate capital to in the forthcoming market regime is very important. And in a nutshell, that's what we do. Uh, we have different investment families, or families of investment models, about seven or eight right now, and each family has a few models underpinning them. And we have market uh, economists, as we call them, a set of strategies that define short-term market regimes uh, given uh, alternative and traditional signals. Great. Are there any questions so far from the audience? All the way in the back there? If you could stand up. <coughs> we'll get you a microphone, but if you want to yell, I'm sure we can hear you. Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, this question is for Pamela. Um, I was just wondering, from a mature organization, how do you manage success and failure prior to execution of derivative strategy, and what method does a big firm like you guys use? 
So it, 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 interesting question as we're trying to embed more data science across um, the organization on, on the investment um, banking side. I think um, part of it is um, to communicate uh, the benefits to the stakeholder, to internal stakeholders in terms of what um, the new process or why, you know, trying to centralize and put more governance around data that we have internally where we're going with the um, what the the end goal of, of doing this is because the for the people that are involved um, you know b being asked to contribute um, for them to think that it's not just a tax on their time but that this is something that you're going to get a benefit of, of from is is critically important um, the other thing I'd say is as we've been trying to move um, into more data science techniques across um, across our um, our research organization it's also um, showing some some wins early on um, having a tangible product that we can show that we can talk to our clients about that we can um, be showcasing um, as an example of where we're going um, technology is always a challenge um, in a large organization um, so trying to find out what can be done with the individuals that are working on the project um, as opposed to waiting for everything to be perfect on the infrastructure side is another way that we can um, that we've been trying to to show progress does that answer your question very good thank you um, so I have a question for all of you and uh, and I'd like you to maybe tackle this uh, one by one um, starting with Arun um, what are the dangers of machine learning are there pitfalls um, are there risks? Are there things that the people in the audience and, and their clients and their end investors um, will need to avoid? Um, can you guys chime in on that? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, dangers and risks. I mean, one, one to point out would be uh, lack of interpretability, which is a, a very a very big problem, um, you know, especially with uh, some more like deep learning methods, which are more like black boxes. Um, you know, it's not even, you know, even though you, you do use all scientific rigor to make sure these methods work, they are using all sort of, you know, proper cross-validation mm -hmm. techniques and, and, and the, you know, uh, performance uh, in auto-sample uh, is done correctly. It's still not clear as to what exactly, how are the input factors being blended to come up with the final answer. And for, for some people, it's very important to know exactly what uh, the transparency on how the factors are being blended. So, and with these, these methods like deep learning, it's almost impossible to do, the, do it very, very clearly. Right, and they might not understand what it is that is in the box. So it's, it's quite difficult. Exactly, sometimes. like w one technique that we employ to help with the interpretability is to take, like, take a complex model and take a bunch of simple models and maybe help explain the yeah. complex model in terms of the simple models. So maybe f try to find a way to quantify which model, which which of the simpler simpler models is the complex model closest to in outputs, uh, and that's one way to kind of gain some interpretability. But it remains an inherent hard problem. Great, thank you. And Andre, you touched on this a little bit in one of your answers earlier. Um, but what are those dangers? You know, what are the dangers uh, of sort of machine learning and uh, and its application to investments? Uh, I'll be speaking about this a little bit later, but the, in a nutshell, in my view, first, it's not a magic box. It's actually pretty hard to make it work consistently, and it takes quite a bit of different resources than most organizations have at their disposal right now, both on the data side and technology side and uh, understanding how to apply both. Second, underfeeding, overfeeding, uh, usual problem that everybody faces. How do you make sure that the trade-off between bias and variance uh, is acceptable to you and what actually it means. Uh, and thirdly, regime determination and feature engineering is actually hard. Uh, a lot of machine learning techniques were developed for advertising technology and it's not a plug and play where you just take it from the West Coast, bring it here, and all of a sudden it works. There are thousands of features to choose from. Right. In ad tech there are a little less, quite less, and uh, I would argue strongly that domain knowledge and uh, understanding how markets work matters in building uh, a machine model that works outside of your testing. So you uh, shouldn't period. necessarily just come from a computer science or, or, or that type of background. You should have some basic skill set which, with, 
regards to the markets, right? With regards to. to I'm speaking from a personal experience trying to uh, be part of building this from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not believe that it's enough. Uh, the reason I don't believe that's enough, there are just way too many degrees of freedom. And uh, there is not enough computational power in the world to just throw everything at it and uh, get the machine learning uh, to come up with an answer. And maybe if you've traded it, it without it before, you know pain. If you know, maybe you know and have experienced um, the traditional way of doing things and you might bring this innovative piece to it and it might make improvements, but you have that knowledge, that history, uh, you know, those skid marks. So, so the, 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 way, the way we view it internally, at least, is the following. Uh, if you fundamentally believe that there are factors that predict the future, you should be able to enhance that uh, predictability with machine learning, given that you have good data and uh, some good techniques and machine learning expertise. Right. Now, if you do not have the understanding of what could be predictive, it's like looking for uh, a needle in a haystack. It's really hard. And if it were not hard, then Google would have been the biggest hedge fund in the world. But so it's kind they of tried, like you could, yeah. and they did not achieve it yet, <clears throat> not to say fail. Well, it's kind of like you can um, figure out the answer if you know the question. If you know what questions in, in you sense, should be yes, asking. But it, it enhances your, uh, your abilities. So you know five factors that I'm just coming up with random numbers. You know five sure. factors that are very predictive. Machine learning can come up with 10 more. And five of them may actually make sense to you if you really think hard about them as a human. But without the machine learning algorithm, you may not be able to discover uh, them. Anticipate. So uh, it's man plus machine that need to work together uh, to really make it happen, in my view. Thank you. And David? Yeah, it, it, and just to tag on his point, it, you know, it's really understanding the underlying mechanisms of what makes you know, all this uh, uh, work. Um, but just you know, from my personal experience doing this, uh, being one of the, the co-architects, you know, it, it, it's data snooping. Um, you, you still have biases no matter what. Um, you know, and at times you've got you know too many parameters, um, you know, too many observations that that can uh, throw a wrench in things. And, and the big thing f for us, it's regime change. You know, being able to accurately predict regime change. So that's. Thank you. And I would just add. Uh, you know, as an, as an analyst, um, I find it incredibly important to be able to understand, uh, to be able to explain why something's working, when it will work, and when it won't work. So the, you know, going back to the points made earlier, um, it really is important to ha have it not be a complete black box where there is some intuition about where the performance is, and you know, any time <coughs> that you're looking at a back-tested strategy, you have to be able to explain why there was a drawdown, why there was underperformance at any given time. The machine learning aspect can actually help to um, to help, you know, whether you're training a model to, to understand how to mitigate those circumstances, but there needs to be some tie to what's actually happening in, in the market. You know, is it an unexpected Trump victory? Is it that the Fed is going to be more hawkish next year? How is, how is your strategy going to react in those situations? And being able to under, to, to explain what inputs and outputs are going to come out of your model um, to some degree is, is what really resonates with investors in my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions from the audience? Yes, sir. We, uh, uh, someone's going to bring your mic This is a little out of left field, admittedly, um, and maybe a better question for the computer scientists in the room. But uh, I'm just curious if any of you four have any thoughts on the potential impact or non-impact of quantum computing in finance over the next 5, 10, 20 years? Just, I'm going to be short here. I think it's going to create opportunity. I think it's going to create inefficiencies, in my, in my point of view. So, Yeah, I think purely from being able to do uh, access, you know, more heavy computational power, it will, you know, it will enable machine learning capabilities to just achieve um, more efficiency. So, you know, you'll be able to, you know, probably throw more factors at a problem, you'll be able to work in, the, in a big data setting even more efficiently. So, but in terms of you know, any inherent benefit of the quantum computing itself, is not, it's, it's just purely in the computational power sense, not, not anything else. Right. I'll to try to add two cents to that. I don't think we're uh, limited by computing power right now, given the access to AWS and those services. We're limited by other factors, that availability, cleansing, uh, factor selection, regime changes, and making smart choices around there. 
it's not about, oh, I can't compute what I need to compute and to a large extent. Go ahead, Dave. No, I just back to my point, people do think, like, you know, based on this question, and, and that's why I feel that, you know, we're going to have great, there's going to be great inefficiencies in, in, in the market from, from that uh, you know, logic, I guess. So um, are there additional questions from the audience? Yes, miss? So David and Andrew, you both mentioned regime changing is very important factor in your strategy, but it seems uh, David is mentioning machine is predicting the machine, uh, the regime uh, switching was a pre-Trump indicator. And uh, Andrew is uh, putting that to the market economists. So did you actually do testing like uh, Norman earlier suggested today to pitch machine prediction against humans and based on the accuracy from the past, decide whether you should give the decision to machine or human or you just uh, go with the comfort level. And also, the if you make human make the decisions, are they really detecting the early signs of regime switching and therefore tell you that it's switched or is actually telling you it's about to switch and uh, I'm making a prediction? So I'll, our computers run everything. Um, you know, there are a few occasions where I'll look under the hood. Um, you know, I'll give you two examples. Um, we we were probably the, one of the only I don't, U.S. Steel. I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, back in uh, March or April, when, when they reported uh, earnings, um, we were short, and there was a lot of momentum in the steel industry uh, with with the Trump, you know, victory and whatnot. You know, I was a little nervous. Um, you know, but. If, Thankfully, it, it went in our favor. Uh, and another company, um, I'll give you another example, ALGN, um, Invisalign. No idea what this company's about. Uh, we're long going into earnings. I Google ALGN, and I see orthodontist, and I start freaking out. Why is an orthodontist worth you know this much money uh, or, or market cap? So there are some instances where I do look under the hood, and I have to make a judgment call. Um, you know, but 99.99% .99 of the time, the computer does everything. Um, when I speak about regime change, um, I'm not going to just, you know, we, we, we're always evolving and we're always, you know, testing the coefficients, you know, on a weekly and, and sometimes daily basis. So um, even though the computer is doing every, everything and the algorithms are, are always spinning, you know, I, I, now, for instance, we're, you know, it looks like we're heading into or we're already in the midst of a regime change. So. Um, your clients, you know, they expect you, uh, I wouldn't say be fortune tellers, but, and I, I don't, you know, we're not fortune tellers, but I'd like to anticipate, you know, some of this change, um, so. Great, and um, I'm gonna start with Arun, and then I'd like to go down to each of you. Um, is there something I sh didn't ask you that I should have that you would like to comment on? Is there any point you would like to make, uh, you'd like to ensure that the audience hears? Uh, well, at, so you know, uh, the 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 phase of uh, inno innovation and early adopters, I think, is already over. So, and I think we are pretty much, I think, in the in the mainstream. I think uh, I, I don't think it's uh, it's still in early adoption phase. So, it's here to stay. I think it's here to benefit all of us. Um, you know, machine learning and AI. So we just have to, you know, be careful in the way we employ it, and you know, we have to just make sure we study it properly, uh, both from building it as well as how we test it, uh, how we cross-validate, uh, all of those best practices. So this is what I will just I'll leave that with, with the audience. So the ship already sailed, and now it's up to the industry to sort of standardize and and uh, and deploy. Right. I think uh, other industries have have sort of taken the lead. Uh, you know. With, with the efforts at you know Google in particular, Amazon and Facebook, and you know we basically in some some fashion we are taking the best of uh, of, of techniques and ideas from you know, especially in deep learning space from there, and there's a lot of uh, work that's needed to adapt it to the financial world, and that's where I think we come in. But um, you know it's it's clearly uh, you know a real thing is here to benefit us. So. Great. Andre, what would you add? Well, I, I still think we're at the beginning of uh, this phenomena, uh, which we call data economy and uh, artificial intelligence uh, in finance. Two years ago, when we just started speaking about it, people looked, most of the people looked at us like we were crazy. Now it's everybody speaks about it. <coughs> I do think that actually it's a little bit overhyped. 
there isn't fundamentally anything extremely different. It's just more information to make better decisions on and better tools to make those decisions. Right now, there's things are called alternative data, uh, like sentiment index, news ingestion. I but can those are things you. that have been around a while, right? So I remember a lot of people 15 years ago, there was sentiment analysis on news that was done with, with mm -hmm. alerts. But would you maybe call this a repackaging of it, a rebranding of it in a way in which it's kind of its own brand that's being pushed forward? There is definitely a repackaging that yes. happened. Uh, but my, my, my point is what, what seems alternative today will not be alternative tomorrow. Something Good. else will be alternative. And the name of the game is to, ha to stay ahead of this and anticipate what is likely to come. Uh, we try to anticipate it with building robust technology that will last for years. And uh, uh, there are other ways maybe to do it. Uh, and uh, if you have insights, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And David, uh, what should I have asked you that I didn't? Well, many things, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but uh, just to, to so I think it's, uh, I think we're in the beginning as well. And I don't think we really know what, what all this means yet. Um, I, I do know, you know, scientifically speaking, um, having data to support, you know, our theories or, you know, our rationale behind, you know, selection, it, it you know, it, it's good. It, it feels good and, and you can, you know, pinpoint you know, why things are working and, and why things are not working, and you can articulate that to the client if you understand the underlying mechanisms of your strategy and, and, and how it works. Um, you know, but uh, we have a long ways to go, so. so uh. But it's a good thing. And uh, Pam, what would you add? Uh, just uh, the most important um, point, I, th I think, and what I always encourage my team to do is Remember that we're, we're trying to make money out of this. There's so many different okay. new techniques. There's so much data out there. There's so okay. many interesting things that you could do with it. But if you're an investment professional, you need to know how to actually use it to, to benefit what you're ultimately trying to do, and that's you know, make a profit and have it enhance your investment strategy. Otherwise, it just becomes a science project. So incredibly important. On that note, please join me in thanking our panel.